welcome to this uh, training on spreading the word and using the media. Um, I uh, work in the global comms team at 350.org and one of the things that we do quite a lot is we offer trainings to, to climate activist groups to, and support them in accessing the media. This is quite a long training uh, which we've condensed into two hours. So please, if there's something not clear or something that you'd like to go back over, please just jump on the microphone and let me know. Um, it is an interactive training, so there will be, uh, hopefully you'll be able to participate and speak and share your thoughts and ideas and we can get to know a little bit about the work that you're doing so that this training can be useful for that. And my other caveat is my children are still on school holidays and they're playing a very noisy card game downstairs so that if you can hear that, that's what's going on. Um, great. Well, I'm going to share my screen. I hope you're all sitting comfortably, um, that you've got a drink handy if you uh, want to um, uh, refresh yourselves. If you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. If you can, turn on your video because it's nice to see faces. And if you've got questions, um, please put them in, in the chat box or put a star in the chat box so that we can hear those questions. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction thing. Um, it'd be really great if you could uh, tell us your name, um, where you are from and, and why you've decided to participate today and what you would like to get from the training. That would be really helpful for us to know how to sort of make sure that we're doing the, the right thing. So does anyone feel brave and feel like jumping on first to introduce themselves? Uh, so I'm Phyllis Hasbrook. I live in Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. I work for 350 uh, Wisconsin and um, I'm taking all the workshops. They all seem so good and I just want to learn a lot. Great. Thank you very much. And y yes, yes, you're on camera. I'm just going to pick. Yes, yeah, I'm yes. From... Uh... India. Uh, I basically, I am uh, in uh, Fridays of Future Mumbai, uh, involved in local activism, local environmental issues, and I'm glad to be part of this workshop. Great, thanks so much. And Victoria, can you, are you able to speak? If you can't speak, do what Frank's done and just put a, a thing in the chat box. Um, um, I can speak. Um, so my name is Victoria and I am also from Fridays for Future, but from the national organizing team of Fridays for Future Ukraine, uh, although I'm currently in the United Kingdom and have been here for a while. And I am also, um, well, I've joined this webinar today because I, I guess I know some basics of working with the media, but I feel like there's loads of um, sort of space for improvement for um from our experience and i'd love to learn more about how to re reach out to media more proactively and um perhaps how to better or more proactively prepare press releases and things like that in advance thank you very much <clears throat> and then frank's introduced himself and the, or themselves in the chat uh, i'd really like to know more about fossil free football uh, i'm uh, a big football fan so that would be very interesting Peek has also introduced themselves in the chat. Uh, hashtag DMFAB Don. Are you able to go online or are you introduce? Hi there. So um, DMAFB stands for Do Me A Favor Buddy. And basically it's a um, movement and a platform where we're trying to use kindness as activism. So uh, to produce a uh, change in the community and also society wide as well. So I'm really um, hoping to use what we learn here to, yeah, to create change. And, you know, we, we want to partner with festivals and also events as well to just create a movement for, for social change. So we're based primarily in the UK and, and Zurich. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think so. Guys, connecting to audio still, so I'm not sure if he is able to speak. And then Boswell, are you able to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Boto Spanda, and uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. And uh, I'm excited to be part of this uh, program. 
uh, so that I can learn more uh, with regards to issues to do with uh, spreading the news. And uh, yes, I'm excited to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us. And then Pooja, you're the last one on my list. Can you, are you able to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Pooja. I'm based in Ben Salem, PA USA, and I work as the Youth Engagement Manager at the Climate Initiative. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for joining. I hope you'll find this session useful. Um, I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Um, Brilliant. Um, so what we're going to look at today is why we use the media, how to develop messages, and then spreading the word, interviews, tips and tricks. And also we'll look a bit into um, looking at press releases and media advisories and that kind of thing. Um, why do we use the media? first and foremost, because they're not always our friends, um, but stories move us. They spring us into action and they resonate with people. If we're doing something, if we're taking part in a campaign or organizing an event, if we use the media, there's a strong chance that we'll be able to reach new audiences beyond our normal bubbles. The other thing about stories is that we pass them on. And often you will hear this, you know, a kind of a casual conversation where you hear someone saying, oh, I heard on the news the other day, or I was listening to the radio, or I read this article. So we have a lot of a lot of culture passing stories on that we hear. We know that using the media can inform and shape and change and shift public debate. And that has been very, very much the case in the climate field where it's gone from being something that was a, you know, a few years ago was a relatively niche issue. And nowadays what we see is climate is really, you know, it's it's widely covered in the media. The other thing um, that we're looking at in this media training a lot is using broadcast media. And the reason for that is that broadcast media is by far the most consumed form of media above newspaper articles. So radio interviews and television globally are the most widely consumed form of media. So it's kind of also really important that we tailor the media work we do to be able to have the confidence to be able to work with those kind of broadcast networks. And the other thing is that the media are going to tell the story anyway, so it's much better that they hear it from us and our viewpoint rather than an interpretation or via someone else. Um, also acknowledging that the media landscape globally is often dominated by the privileged and those with the most access. We've been working a lot in doing in working with frontline communities and people that are much less represented in the media to lift up their voices rather than having you know somebody from the UK telling the story of someone in Latin America in a community, but really making sure that those resources are directed to the communities that need them. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing that is by opening space and doing trainings like this for people to be able to tell stories in their own words, um, by making opportunities accessible for everyone. So that's particularly been working with a lot of the youth uh, from Fridays for the Future, making sure that they're represented in their in their strikes um, by passing the microphone. So one of the you know, one of my critiques of big kind of climate NGOs like 350, except we don't do this, is that people use the media opportunities for themselves. But what we're really keen to do is if there's someone better to tell the story, then we'll pass. We always pass the microphone to that group or organization. And the other thing is recognizing that when you step up and talk to the media, it, it's hard. Um, you know, you can get a lot of criticism, the interview can go badly, you might get end up being misquoted. And so the other thing that's really important is if you're going to have people that are stepping up to, to do media work is that they're supported by the rest of the group. Um, healthy storytelling looks like storytelling that's free from harmful stereotypes um, and making assumptions. And, on, and as I said before, honoring the, the effort and risk and vulnerability it, it does require to tell stories and to share experiences. So what we're trying to do in developing our messages is we're trying to activate the base. And that means the people that are already on board feel inspired and empowered and want to get involved. And then we want to persuade the middle. We're not going to persuade everyone to get on board with what we're doing. But if you think about a wheel, think about where we probably are on the wheel is that we're kind of active when we're doing things. We wanna get the people that are in the middle who aren't quite sure to, to feel inspired to take action. And by doing that, we wanna make the people that are still climate skeptic or resistant to what we're telling them, show the opposition for the outliers that they are. And so 
when we're developing our messaging, what's really critical is that you think about who we're trying to talk to. Um, and often, I mean, we're all, I'm really guilty of this, but we are so involved in the work that we're doing. We think everyone understands uh, the jargon and the acronyms that we're using. And particularly with climate crisis, there's all these IPCC and all these different bodies of, of organizations um, that we use. There's also so many numbers and statistics in, in the climate crisis, so, you know, 1.5 and two degrees and this and that. Um, and all of those things are great when we're doing that work, but if we're trying to persuade that middle, uh, then it's a bit more confusing. And I don't know if people uh, have heard of Marge Simpson <clears throat> from The Simpsons, but um, we use her to sort of try and describe the sort of person that we're trying to talk to when we're using the media. Um, interestingly, broadcast media like television and radio that is mostly consumed by women over a certain age who are sympathetic to these things, but they probably got the television on in the background. They've heard about climate crisis or climate change, but they're not really engaged. They're not really involved. And we've all got someone in our life like that who, you know, our grandma, a friend, a cousin, a dad who thinks, well, you know, Kim, oh, it's great what you're doing. It's slightly, slightly nuts. And I don't really understand it. So I'd like you to think about who is your Marge. Like, who is that person in your life who has heard about climate change but doesn't really want to do anything about it or doesn't really know how to do anything about it? Uh, and I'm going to risk it for a biscuit and make this session interactive. I'm going to break you into pairs. So we are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, yeah, five groups of two. Uh, it's going to be really random. You're going to be chucked into a room with someone. Um, and you might have to type with Frank because he's on a train. Um, but what we would like you to do is to share um, with that person. We want you to explain a campaign or something that you're working on without using jargon, without using statistics, imagining that you're trying to talk to your Marge. Are people following me? Does that sound OK with you all to do that? Okay, so this is just a really quick exercise. It's a five minute exercise. Um, and if it doesn't work and you haven't got anyone in your breakout room, just come back to the to this main room and we'll, we'll just do it. We'll just uh, repeat once as it was, there was a connection cut off. Could you just uh, repeat once in short? Yeah, so we're gonna break into small groups and we would like you to share who the Marge is in your life. Who is the person has heard about climate crisis but doesn't really get it and doesn't really understand why you're working on it and we would like you to tell them about a campaign or something that you're doing or that you've heard about we'd like you to explain it to them without using jargon without using statistics um and just practice kind of talking about what you're doing without imagining that you're not in a in a group of people that under you know working on climate issues does that make sense OK, if your breakout room, if there's no one in it or it's not working, just come back to this main room here and we'll all do it together. And this is a really quick exercise. It's going to be five minutes. Hey, everyone, welcome back. I hope that was useful. Um, and I always, often think it's a surprisingly difficult thing to actually do. Uh, does anyone have any reflections that they'd like to share or anything that stood out to them from their breakout room group? When we think about how to connect to our audiences, Often uh, emotions are something re that really in that really inspire people or that evoke something in people. So when we're doing interviews or when we're developing our, our campaigns and our press releases, thinking about a story is a really great strategy to engage our audience and develop an emotional connection. Stories are kind of a, a visual approach to messaging, making it more exciting or more memorable. But also when you can connect to the person who whose story it is, is very, very different from having, you know, kind of a dry scientific interview about climate impacts. When it's when we're actually talking to people who are impacted by something that's happening, it can really make a difference in how people respond to that media piece. Um, 
understanding humor is important, compassion is important, empathy is important, um, being able to create something that is visual for people so they can so you can inspire an emotion in them is really also very useful. But also I think when we're developing our messaging, it's really important to think about why we're taking this action in the first place. Like what is the problem? And so often when we are putting together when we're thinking about a campaign or something that we're doing in, in 350 and we're putting together our messaging work around it, we th you know, first of all, you kind of explain the problem. Then you talk about what you're doing about it. And then what's the solution? Like what's the, what's the way forward in addressing it? And if you can, when you're packaging up what you do, it's really useful to have that so people can see a, a clear pathway forward. So the problem, what you're doing and the solution. Um, when you're doing media work and if you're stepping up to do media work, you are the expert and you must be able to provide valuable insight, but also take a firm stance. And so that's that can be really tricky, especially if you're doing what we call hostile interviews where someone's trying to throw you off course. It's really useful to have some evidence and statistics to back up things if you need to. But be very, but it's also really important to, 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 to do fact checking. Um, so for example, if you're doing something and you put in a press release that 85% of something is that, make sure it's a correct statistic because if there's somebody that wants to take you down or criticize your campaign, then they will use that against you. Um, the other thing as well, which is a very good technique, I think is when we feel that we have to have the answers all the time, that can be really tricky, but we can also ask questions to people. We can also say to interviewers or to the audience, well, you know, what? Ha how would you feel if this was happening to you or something like that? So being able to like throw questions back at people is really useful. So in our media toolkit, we, we have a few, we have these five kind of things that we try and use to develop our messaging. The first one being speak to people's best self, like assume good intentions from your audience uh, and the audience isn't the villain. And often we can feel defensive doing our media work. We feel that other people aren't doing enough around things. So we can be, you know, we can come across as defensive and hostile. So it's really important to try and relate to, to people, creating common ground. So um, I've got three kids. So, so you know, if I, I, I often be like as a, as a mother of three children, I am very concerned about the impacts of climate change on them and their future, like something that will resonate with people that are consuming this media source. As I said before, talk about change, explain the problem, but also have a solution or also have something that people can go like, oh, well, that's a, a good idea. So there's a light bulb moment built into it. Have facts, but don't rely on facts and figures alone. Um, and the other one that's really, really tricky in, in interviews is like not responding. And this is and this is not to be dishonest, but you don't have to always respond to the question from the interviewer or the question from your opponents. Try to stay on course and try to stick with your frames and with your values, your vision and, and your message. And we'll talk a little bit later on about how to do that. Before we get into more into the interview tips and tricks, we'll talk about some of the things that we do before that to generate media interest. We're going to look at understanding journalists and the media cycle, looking at ways of reaching out, and then we'll talk about on the day, um, how to how to maximize media attention on the day of an event or a campaign or an action. So what does the media want? So the media cycle is intense. It's 24 hours and there's a lot of potential media outlets, radio, broadcast, tele, um, social media, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The job of the media is to tell a story. And what they want is accurate, useful and timely information that, that will connect with their readers, listeners and viewers. So when we're giving the media information, we need to think about that. Uh, we need to make sure it's accurate, because if it's accurate, they'll come back to you time and time again. So it's useful for them to have the media needs to have contacts with with our slot because we're doing things that they're going to cover. Uh, we also need to make sure that the uh, information is given timely. And this is something that I think people often underestimate. The media cycle is very, very rapid and you have to go with it if you want to get the media attention. So when they say, can you send us a photo of this action? It means send the photo of the action like straight away. Or if they want to do a broadcast interview with someone, um, they'll want to know within the next 10 minutes that they've got someone for their program on the six o'clock news. 
and this is something that we that that we frequently I think we frequently struggle with as commons people is is really trying to get fellow activists to understand that the media cycle is really rapid it's really urgent and if they if we don't have an answer quickly they'll just go somewhere else and go somewhere else um if you can uh visuals are really really important or sound bites or something like that so you've got something to attach to a story um and the other thing that i always like to say is the moment it, with this point is that journalists can be very lazy actually you know they want the story handed to them in a plate so as much of it as you can give them the better like give them the information give them the photo here's the telephone number of the person that you can interview about it so it's really laid out for them um so the first thing that we do uh, when we're doing an event or a campaign or a day of action is we outreach to the media by sending a media advisory template. And we've got a media toolkit, which is online, which can be downloaded or I can stick it in the chat so you can use this. Um, but these are the type of things that we would think are really important that you should have in this media advisory. The media advisory does not need to be very long. If you can imagine that media are getting you know, 50 of these a day, they need to scan it and be able to, this is what I need to know, what's happening, who to contact, um, why it's important, where it's happening. And then if you can put a couple of quotes or from people that will be participating or use a couple of your key messages, then they can kind of get the, the tone of it. And this is something that we send before an event takes place. Then what we do after the event takes place so you might get an email back from the journalist saying really interesting but we we can't send anyone down there we haven't got anyone could you send me information after the event so then we send a press release now often we send the press release before an event's taken place uh, but the day of for example and that goes into more detail about what's happening um and then if you look at the kind of body of that we're suggesting here that you would add a couple of quotes from people that have participated in the event uh, and include an image if you've got one. So these are the two kind of critical things that we that we would use to send to the media. The other thing that we are finding increasingly is that journalists will be looking on Twitter um, to follow an event. So also really, really useful if you've got those quotes already to put them out on a on a Twitter account so that if journalists are following the event, they can just pick the quote off of Twitter. Has anyone got any um, questions or clarification points or anything like that at this point? Uh, can I just double check? Uh, did you say that the press release is more for on the day of the event? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so media advisory is something you send to let them know it's happening, so it's on their radars, and then the press release is more, is is has got more detail in it, um, and it's you can be use it as a wrap up. So, for example, um, you know, we send things like saying twenty thousand people have participated in this rise for climate action, um, and so that the journalist has got the story pretty much written for them, actually. Sure, thank you. And this is just, you know, re-emphasizing the need for images um, that could be taken. So really making sure somebody is available with a decent camera to take images of what's happening uh, that can accompany the press release that you send. Particularly, I think with, um, you know, with social media, like if, if media outlets are gonna put something up, then the image is really he helpful for engaging people in the content. So we're going to look a bit more at interview tips and tricks. So ideally what's happened, you imagine that you've you've had a, an event, you've had a mobilization, lots of people have come, it's been very successful and the media are like, oh my God, we need to get people on the evening news. So then you'll be invited to take part in an interview. Um, and so what we like to say is stay on message. So ideally what you've done before your event is you've come up with your key messages that you want to get across. Um, don't respond to to attacks. Keep the interview. Keep to your agenda. Say, for example, you you've done a, a you know a demonstration on water pollution. You've gone on the evening news, and suddenly they're asking you about EV batteries, and you're like, you know nothing about EV batteries. You know, you need to be able to steer the interview back to what it is you can talk about. Um, 
and also the other thing is we we don't know there's different types of intuition we're going to look at it look at it later on in the presentation but hit your key messages early on is what we like to say they might only ask you one question you might only have 30 seconds so make that amount of time count so if you've got your three key messages um get them into your first answer uh, and then you can repeat them if you need to, or then you can kind of go down a go down another route. But make sure you kind of hit them fairly early on. Um, so, uh, creating common ground. So these are some of the phases that, like, we would suggest that could be used for opening up your first answer. So you're trying to identify with the audience. That's what you're trying to do. You're not talking to the journalist who's interviewing you you or the presenter you're talking to the people behind that so we use phrases like we all want or what we all can agree on is that we need to take action on the climate crisis now no matter where we all come from we all deserve to have clean water clean air those kind of things so really trying to universalize what you're doing and creating a connection with with an audience um when you get a tricky question, it can really throw you off kilter. Um, and this is something that you'll probably see politicians doing a lot uh, when they get asked a question and you're just like, please just answer the question. What we we call this ABC, which is acknowledge the question, create a bridge to what you want to talk about and communicate. And this is really not to be dishonest, but it's to, to be realistic about media interviews. It's like, um presenters often don't know necessarily a huge amount about the issue and they, and they think it's all part of the same thing so it's about enabling you to have some control um in a media interview so for example going back to the ev battery example where you, you you've done an event about water pollution and you're being asked about ev batteries and you might say something like I understand what you're saying about EV batteries, but what I am most worried about in our community is the level of contamination in the agua, in the water. Um, and, you know, those these kind of things kind of give you a give you back a control in an interview situation. Um, or I, but I think the real question we need to be asking is, is enough action being taken on the climate crisis? So you can try and use some of these phases. I mean, play around with them find the ones that you're most comfortable with using because they have to flow for you but um these are just some suggestions that we've got that we like to use um so imagine that you're going into a tv studio for an interview uh we call this the back of the envelope technique it doesn't have to be a back of an envelope it is a piece of A4, A5 paper. I don't know if you can see me, but it's like that. Um, it's the size of an A5 envelope. Uh, and what we like to do is just, this is something that you can use to, to be a bit of a safety net. So for example, the first thing to do is write, a, write the name of your host, the name of the person that you're going to be, the name of the presenter. Um, and that's quite useful for being quite it, hum it quite quickly creates a rapport between you and the interviewer, but it also humanizes a lot the the kind of the situation. If you can say, good afternoon, Jack, thanks very much for having me on the show. Um, the personal mantra is an important one. And I think sometimes like we all suffer from kind of imposter complex of being like, oh, my goodness, why am I doing this? Da, 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 da. And it's like, no, you're the right person to do this. Like the thing that you need to say to yourself to give yourself the confidence and the ability to go on TV or go on the radio and talk to, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of people, like something that makes you believe in you. And then just to help the name of your Marge, the name of the person that, you know, who you, so you can remember what your who your audience is. Um, and then this is going back into our, into our kind of what's the problem, um, what we're doing about it and what the solution is. Um, and so these can be your key messages, the three things that you want to say, the reason that you're taking, doing the event that you're doing, um, what the shared value is, like what, why it's important, what we can all do about it. And then what's the solution. And then if you can, we call it the phase that pays, which is the thing that really visualizes it for people who are consuming this particular media thing. So, um, you know, something like the US, thankfully this isn't the case, the US has just driven a wrecking ball through the climate negotiations or something like that that kind of 
really makes it quite visual for someone when you're trying to describe what's happening in a you know in a situation. Um, and then just at the bottom, and the, the point of keeping it on an A5 piece of paper is that it's it's small. So you're not going into an interview with like, you know, a whole book full of all your notes and all these things that you want to say that you probably won't get around to saying. So you have your your bridge, your ABC, your thing that you feel comfortable with saying, well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I'd like to, you know, the, the, the phrase that you use to get yourself back on track have a cap, couple of stats and numbers, not a huge amount, but something that you, you know is correct and something you're comf comfortable with using. And then a story, um, like why, why are you connected to this particular event could be one of them, like something that makes people identify with you as, as the person that's being interviewed. Um, and then your safe and strong answer. So, um, I'm just going to read through this, but this it's something like that you can come back to. It's like when you need to reinforce yourself in these kind of situations that you've or you've got a safe place where you go and you go, I can always say that. And the worst, you know, if I'm really doing badly, I can always have this. And that can be like often it can be like, why, why did you get involved in this? Why do you, why do you care about this particular issue or something that's happened to you that made you, inspired you to take climate activism? Um and these are really going back to this idea of connecting with people emotionally and being human in these kind of media situations, like being able to uh, deliver strong answers that the viewer will connect to and likely remember because they'll, re they'll remember you. So um, this is again a workshop session where we're going to look a little bit into developing some key messages and we would normally do this because we often do this with groups of people that are working on a specific issue. Um, but as you're, we're all working on quite different things, um, I think what would be useful is if we could maybe go into smaller groups, maybe three smaller groups, Dave, that's all right. And just maybe think together about coming up with one key message for your campaign or, or your event that you're doing. And then we'll come back to a group and it would be good to go around and hear those the, that key message that you've developed. Does that make sense? Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, almost everyone, I think we're mostly here. Um, it would be really great if any groups fancy sent, uh, sharing any of the key messages they came up with uh, to hear them. Does any does anyone fancy jumping on from the first group maybe? was this us so we, i think we were room one yeah um okay so uh our message is that um the international energy agency has already called for um, the world to stop the proliferation of fossil fuels uh we have enough uh to sort of um enough resources uh for the next 10 years um but a government still continue to uh, fund extraction projects of fossil fuels and we believe that the first step to fossil fuel non-proliferation is to stop um, the uh, funding and the buying of uh, fossil fuels from Russia which is a terrorist regime and has funded the war in Ukraine um, so we call for an immediate embargo on Russian oil um, and gas everywhere. I mean, that nails it, I think. <laughs> I really, I think you managed to communicate quite a complex set of things in a very short period of time in a way that I think um, most people would have got it. The only the only question I had is about the word proliferation because I think that's slightly more jargony. But yeah. it's a slightly bit technical. But apart from that, I think that was really spot on. Thank you. Anyone else from your group want to add anything? Okay, next group. Can you rival that? I don't know what's the next group, but I will go. 
it's me. it's you there was only two groups in the end oh. okay now i have to go back and find it okay uh because the proposed oil pipeline called line five could contaminate lake superior which contains one tenth of the world's fresh water we are calling on the wisconsin department of natural resources to reject the permit needed to build it Excellent, really, really clear and really clear what the problem is, what you're doing about it and what the solution is. And so I think that's really great. Does anyone else from your group wanna add anything? Okay, cool. I mean, it's very much being put on the spot and normally you wouldn't only have 10 minutes to come up with your key campaign messages, but it's a good exercise, I think, in thinking about this type of thing. I'm gonna go back into the presentation now and um, slightly more kind of <clears throat> technical stuff about uh, media interviews. Um, this is one of the most, one of the things I think is really irritating about media interviews is that they say, they say that um, content is less than 10% of what people see and it's voice and persona account for 90%. So that's something to really kind of bear in mind when you're doing a, a media interview. Um, so ahead of an interview, get details for the setting from the journalist. So you need to know if the interview is going to be live or pre-recorded. And there's a big difference there, because if it's live and they're going to be interviewing you live, you can really get all your key messages across until they cut you off. If it's pre-recorded, they're just going to take a sound bite out of it. So you have to be a bit more kind of, you know, be prepared to be potentially asked more questions than you want to, but really have your key messages nailed. You need to know how long you're going to be interviewed for. Obviously, there's a big difference between 30 seconds and the 30 minute long program. You need to know what the program is, so who's watching the program um, and what type of program it is. If it's a daytime one, who it's orientated towards. Ask them about the journalist about the storyline or the bias they might be using. So for example, if they bring you on because there's been some notice about some uh, new kind of oil plant being developed, like what's the, what is the storyline that the, that the media outlet are using? Because that will also impact on how you might tweak your messaging. And then understand if you're going to be put up against anyone. So this is really important because if you, so I, often they'll, get two people on one from one side and the other from the other side so kind of important to know who you will be up against um and also if you've got the time to do it just look at who you're going to be up against twitter account or something so you can kind of see perhaps the messages that they might be using or putting across um start with what you feel comfortable with so you know if you think you might be taken down the garden path so to speak with it make sure you start with the stuff that you feel comfortable with and that's really orientated to why you're there in the first place practice and i can't elaborate enough um how important it is to practice these interviews and what you'll find is if you get interviewed a lot about the same thing it really does start to roll off the tongue and it feels like you know you're just really prepared for it but the first couple of times it can be really unnerving um, so if you're in the shower or, you know, coming back from dropping your kids to school or what have you, just, you know, it's not crazy to talk to yourself and practice your interview. Um, developing your your what your Q and A's. So what questions are you most likely to be asked? And, and this can also be quite a fun exercise if you're doing something to like think about uh, what types of questions you might be asked and then how you can fit your key messages into those answers. Um, if you've got statistics and facts, double check them beforehand. As we know, climate change is a very fast changing world and something that was a fact a couple of months ago is now changed to something else. Um, and that would be some of the things we would recommend to prepare for an interview. Um, if you're going to be on tally, uh, think about your outfit. Um, be confident with it um you know sometimes i mean i've made this mistake of thinking i have to go very dressed up to an interview and then being feeling really really uncomfortable in my clothes so wear something that you feel good in um and that you feel confident with um in studio for tv they normally will put makeup on you um which will stop your face from shining in the lights and and stuff like that we would recommend you you do 
It is also said that you shouldn't wear busy patterns and not have shiny materials because that's kind of reflects on the camera. But again, that's a really cultural thing because that's not always possible and people wear different things. And that can also be really important culturally to be wearing an outfit, which is important for you. Um, <clears throat> but generally kind of avoiding shiny materials because they can reflect on the camera and then avoiding kind of totally black colors or totally white colors also. Wearing neutral colors. So there's three, generally there's three different types of interview. There's on the ground. So this can be at the event or the, 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 the thing that you're doing um, where you'll be presented on the site of something. There often be live interviews um, and that's, they'll just happen very spontaneously and you just have to be ready for it. Um, we find a lot of the times, for example, if we've got quite a big event, you can have quite a wrangle of media trying to interview one or two of the same people. So if you have got people that are available to support in that moment that can be going there, taking the name of the journalist and, and supporting the person that's doing the interviews, that's really, really useful. It's quite hard to do interviews at the same time as dealing with three or four different media outlets coming and asking you questions. So having a couple of people that can do media wrangling is really useful. Um, down the line, is a lot more common now from from COVID times. So that means doing remote location, remote interviews, uh, doing interviews via Zoom um, or FaceTime or something like that. Um, and we'll look uh, further down the line about really trying to think about your setup when you do that. So making sure you've got good lighting, making sure that your camera, you, you might, I've seen quite a lot of interviews where people have got their computers below them and you end up looking up their nostrils for the interview. So really just taking the time to place your camera, think about lighting and all those kind of things. Um, and in the studio interviews, which are by far the most kind of intimidating uh, types of interview, um, and again, make, make sure you know uh, who you, if there's going to be other people on the panel or if it's a one to one scenario and how long the interview is going to take place for. Um, some body language advice. Um, so sit on the edge of your seat is something they say rather than sort of slouched, slouched around like that. Look directly at the camera. So you might even have the presenter who would be sitting, you know, further to the left or the right of the actual camera but actually look at directly at the camera when you're talking even though it's tempting to look at the the interviewer um have a straight back um look relaxed smile when it's appropriate and even with radio interviews we often say this you know just have a try and practice this kind of default position where you smile um and then when you need to change the emphasis on something or where you need to talk about something more seriously, then you can switch off from the smile. Hand movements. Um, I'm really, really flappy with my hands and I'm always like moving them around. And I think one of the things you have to do quite intentionally in an interview is think about where you put your hands. Sometimes it's really useful to emphasize a point with a hand gesture, um, but for the most part, it's important to find a kind of comfortable sitting place for your hands to be. Focus on your breath um, and always go slower than you think you need to. Um, and then if you're on your phone, stand up. If they can't see you, stand up just because it gives, you know, it gives you a bit more energy. You, you, you can sort of feel that that kind of movement in an interview. Um, so before speaking, take a deep breath. Uh, speak slowly, smile, and aim for 45 seconds to one minute answers. If the interviewer wants to cut you off, they will. Um, so this is really your moment. So you feel free to take control of it. That's what you need to do. And let the interviewer say, I'd like to ask you another question or yes, but what about that? So that you can really give the full answers that you need to give and get your messages across. Um, as we like to say, practice, 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 practice with your friends, practice in the shower, um, make eye contact, all those kind of things. Um, and make sure you've got a team to support you afterwards. So here's just a bit of advice if you're doing um, remote interviews in terms of tech setup. So check the internet connection, check the microphone beforehand. Um, Put your camera eye level, as I mentioned before. Frame your head so it's in the center rather than to the left or to the right of the, of the camera. 
think about your background and what it says about who you are. Um, we've all got quite used to that, I think, in, in COVID times. But that is, you know, if you've got a really, really busy background, then people will be looking at the background. Um, don't be too close to the wall behind you and avoid light from just one side or, or a really dark room. So the lighting is really important. Has anyone got any questions or clarification points at all? Okie dokie. Um, so imagine that you've done your day of action and you've you've had some media coverage. Um, producers, what we're finding is that producers are increasingly relying on social media to find people to come and do interviews and check up on potential spokespeople to interview. So thinking about how you might use your social media accounts or your Twitter accounts, that's one way that journalists will be able to find and connect with your, your campaigns and your organisation. Um, so if you want to do media work and if your group is doing media work, really think about your social media strategy associated with it. So this is a colleague of ours called Ellen who does quite a lot of media interviews. She's got a, a, a pinned tweet. She's, she, they publish uh, a lot on, on their Twitter account about issues that they're involved with, that they're concerned with. Um, they hashtag the subject so it's easy to search from that point of view. Um, and it's something that we say to all the people that we kind of train as spokespeople, like really do take that part of it seriously, because that's how people will find you. If you've done an interview as well, it's really useful to try and to grab it from from the media, from the interview that you've done. So you can put that up on social media, social media and share it around your networks. And that's kind of one of the biggest ways we end up kind of keeping a story going or making something become more viral is by sharing those news clippings after an event because they get shared on social media and people see them very short snippets maybe you've done a really long interview and you're not happy with it but you said something really brilliant for 20 seconds if you can grab that then you can share that um we also say and i hope this is going to work um that it it's also good to pin a tweet so if a producer is looking for someone to interview then if you've got a short video pinned to you at the top of your Twitter account then they can get an idea of how you come across what you're likely to speak about um, and it gives them the confidence to book you it's also really really great practice trying to do your one minute video to sort of talk about why you're why you're doing what you're doing and I'm just going to try and show you this if this works can you see that from our I'm not sure if it's going to work this is from our chief executive May who's did her, done her one minute video. Activist, but I was alone and I wondered how the problems I cared about could possibly be addressed without being part of a wider community. So I joined together with friends and in 2009, we organized 5,200 events in 182 countries calling for climate action. From there, we banded together with networks of activists all over the globe and formed 350.org. Our mission is to accelerate the end of the age of fossil fuels. Because climate change truly is connected to everything we care about, and we can only fight this fight by working together. So I think that's kind of like a nice example of, um, you know, just somebody explaining a bit who they are, why they're involved, um, you can obviously see that, that May is comfortable with speaking to the camera and it just helps producers knowing like, oh, OK, we'll get May on something because she she's obviously got that experience. So that's another thing that you can do to start to build up your profile in the media as a spokesperson. So. Um, so I've just. Um, these are just some interview practice questions that we've used in the past for this type of thing. Uh, when you get a host, when you get a question that sounds hostile, it's it's often not. It's often a way of the interviewer trying to really get the get that information out of you um, or get, give you the opportunity to tell the story um, that you think is important for you. And these are just literally random questions that we've been asked in the last few months by journalists, which don't necessarily have anything to do 
uh, with the work that we do, but we put them in here as an example of, you know, you've gone to talk about your campaign on a pipeline and then you're suddenly you're being asked about why woolly mammoths have died out um, because of climate change and has climate, isn't the climate always changed? And just when you're doing an interview, these kind of questions can really put you off, but actually they're an opportunity to, to really bring in your key messages. Um, so I just put them there. You can just peruse them at your at your leisure if you've got access to the presentation. Um, when you've got uh, uh, so we we recommend that you do role plays, and if we do the longer version of this training, um, we do sort of more role playing where we take on the role of being the journalist and being um, being the in person being interviewed um it's also we have like what we call the average newspaper journalist like non-hostile interviews who is curious about what it is you're doing probably really on board already will ask inquisitive questions and will invite you to expand on them but then you have um more challenging journalists who are kind of trying to perhaps shut you down a bit or ask more probing questions or ask if you're being realistic what you're doing or looks for ways to kind of discredit what you're doing so again we would suggest as part of the process of doing your media work as well as building out the messages and doing the press releases etc is take the time to write some of these critical questions down that you could potentially be asked um and i think with all of you have kind of heard you know whether it's the pipeline or whether it's like you know the full embargo on russian oil and gas all of those those campaigns invite very critical questions about what then happens. So working out ways that they might try and chip you up and responses to that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna open the floor to questions now because that is uh, more or less the end of the presentation. And we won't, as I said, we won't do the, the role playing thing. If anyone's, I'm just gonna say, if anyone's interested in following any of this up with me, I'm always available and I'll put my, um, my email in the chat because sometimes it's easier if you've got kind of questions or things like that but yeah I'm opening the floor to you guys if you've got um I've just put in the chat as well we've got um something which we call our media toolkit which goes through all of this in a lot more detail um and talks about uh media advisories and press releases but also um looks at using opinion pieces so this is another way of, of getting media coverage is if there's an event happening or something happening and you've got a particular take on it um and then you can do what we call pitching so you can write to a media outlet and say we're from fridays for future we are about to do this action calling for an end to russian oil and gas and then um pitch that particular piece to it to a newspaper article and they might say yeah that would be brilliant we can have it and then you can start to then it'll come out as an opinion piece in a paper which can then be used to share the other thing is letters to the editor which is mostly we do that in response to something so if a media outlet's produced an article which is in incorrect or we feel is biased you, you have to you know write a letter to the editor saying following that article of this day we would like to say that but yeah um the media toolkit is is very useful as is our 350.org trainings page which has got loads more resources on them the other thing that we've done recently is the um a lot of this spokesperson training is, is based on an organization called neon from the uk which is the new economic organizers network um and they do media trainings for groups so mostly uk based but the spokesperson handbook which accompanies this training we've just translated it into uh it's in ukrainian it's in spanish it's in portuguese and i can't remember what else it's in but anyway um that's also freely available to be used and on our website and please oh sorry didn't have access thanks day um any more questions Thoughts? I just want to say this has been wonderful. There's so much to digest, um, but it's really, really good advice. So thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, and also just to, you know, just to say, I mean, we're really up for supporting groups and organizations with stuff. I often 
say this particularly with media lists or passing on media contacts and things like that as well you know do feel free to email I really want to know what that means now Victoria <laughs> well that is pretty much the end of the training um we're a bit before time but that's okay um i'm very happy to sit here if people want to take time to think of questions and stuff or ask things but if not we can say goodbye and I wish you all the best for your upcoming events and yeah please stay in contact thanks everyone bye Bye. Thank you. Bye.